often. So yeah. <laughs> We hope the first of many, but uh, definitely the first either way. So uh, we're, we're happy to have you here and hope that you'll come back and uh, bring a friend when you do. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of uh, quick notes of thanks. So uh, first of all, thank you to our uh, team members that have worked really hard to put this on, uh, to line up our guests, to get all the technical details in place. We really appreciate it. Uh, Janelle Sims and Curtis Wilcox managing a lot of our AV, uh, Eric Manser and Jamie Spear uh, wrangling all of the, the little loose ends. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for, for all you have done to get all of us, me included, where we need to be, uh, when we need to be there uh, to, to put on a great event. Um, <clears throat> we will have a few speakers today. Uh, to talk about many things that are happening, as the event indicates, uh, related to digital accessibility at Harvard on today, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, at Harvard and around the world. So um, we're, we're just thrilled. Our first speaker that I have the pleasure of introducing uh, comes to us from Harvard. She's uh, Dr. Alexa Stokes. She is our Associate Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer from the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, uh, where she served for several years. Uh, prior to, to that role, she served as the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard. So she's got a long track record of, of doing great work here at Harvard. She has her hands in so many different things. She works on our Administrative Innovation Group, She's on the executive committee of the Women in Technology Plus Allies group here at Harvard, so uh, knows her way around technology and the technology communities at Harvard. Um, she has an extensive uh, academic background in what we do. She has her doctorate in education, leadership, and policy from Vanderbilt University, uh, and she's done great work uh, winning awards for her dissertation, doing outstanding work. She's a champion of uh, minoritized communities and a champion of historically black colleges and universities. A lot of great work in education in the nonprofit sector uh, for a long time. And we're grateful to have her here today. At Harvard, she certainly plays some of our leadership and governance roles related to accessibility generally and digital accessibility specifically. Uh, so please help give a warm Harvard welcome to Dr. Alexis Stokes. Thank you um, and good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me. It is really an honor to be here. Um, I will apologize in advance that I'm not able to stay for the entire event. We have our final meeting following this for our affinity celebrations that will launch next week. And I'll touch on that a little bit in some of my remarks. Um, so I join you from ODIB and it is just really an honor to not just serve in this role, but as was mentioned, to also be a member of the University Accessibility Committee as well as co-staffing the Student Accessibility Advisory Group with Kate Higgins from UDR. So these are just two examples of how ODIB partners with university leaders, but also key offices on campus to drive equity and access forward and specifically to drive accessibility forward and to make it very clear that disability is diversity. And it absolutely is a part of our priority areas. We work very closely with UDR. We're extremely grateful for the partnership there. It is through our partnership with UDR, as well as the Student Accessibility Advisory Group, that Kate and I are working closely with students around looking at our orientation materials across campus. So as we know within our very decentralized structure, it is not often we have the opportunity to make change and impact within each school. And so to be looking at our orientation materials to not only increase awareness of the resources that exist, but remove barriers to accessing those resources for our students. But also for us to identify where are the gaps in those resources and how can we work together through the University Accessibility Committee to address those gaps and fill those gaps. We also have worked together to launch the inaugural affinity celebration honoring graduates with disabilities that will take place on Monday at 9 a.m. at the Harvard Business School. It will be live streamed, so I invite each of you 
to tune in and join us for this joyous occasion and celebrating these amazing students that have accomplished so many things over their time here at Harvard and that we know will go on to do amazing things within our society and take up this charge of advancing accessibility and specifically advancing digital accessibility. So I couldn't be here and not mention our updated digital accessibility policy. I am thrilled that this is an example of how we can come together and drive accessibility forward. It is everyone's responsibility. And one of ODIB's priorities is how do we embed equity and access principles in our structures, in our frameworks, and in our policies? And this digital accessibility policy is an example of how we do that. And so the partnerships and collaborations, the leadership that was at place for that policy to move forward is something that we can hold up and say, we can do this in many areas of our institution. We can embed these principles to make sure that we are an accessible campus where everyone can thrive. And we also value every voice to be a part of that process and at the table. So I thank you again for allowing me to be here to celebrate this day with you all, as well as to work with you beyond today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexis, for those great remarks. Uh, we're so happy to um, partner with you and your whole team in the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Belonging. Uh, great efforts. One of the things that we talk about every time we present about digital access at Harvard is that that is one of the ways, the many, many ways that those, uh, those who work on technology can directly impact uh, the way Harvard is inclusive and welcoming to those with disabilities. Maybe working on that document or that website might not be what you think of as uh, an equity mindset, but it absolutely can be. In uh, Alexis's remarks, she mentioned our new digital accessibility policy. And if you've heard from me lately, you know I am obligated at least every 15 minutes to talk about the policy. So I'm gonna do so very briefly uh, to make sure you're aware of it. And uh, all of the awesome resources that are available to you as members of the Harvard community and even beyond to help support you in helping create uh, more inclusive digital content. So uh, as you may uh, have heard, uh, the announcement went out to our community last month. It was on April 11th that uh, it was a message from our provost, our executive vice president, and our university chief information officer uh, telling us that we are expanding and increasing the policy related to accessibility. And the policy just says that we want all of the electronic content at Harvard to follow web content accessibility guideline principles. We want all of our, our stuff at Harvard to be accessible so that everyone at Harvard and around the world can contribute to our teaching and research mission, uh, which is a great stance to take. It's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of effort to live up to that, uh, but it's a great that our policy reflects those values uh, that everybody we talk to says that's what we wanna do. Uh, a few things, our team has lots of supports available to you uh, to help make digital content accessible. <laughs> uh, shameless plug, if you have not already visited it, but I hope and I'm sure you have, um, it's probably your homepage bookmarked, uh, but accessibility.huit, that's H-U-I-T, dot harvard.edu is our team's webpage. And uh, the team does a great job of constantly updating uh, content, resources, guides. I know we have a few guests from outside the university today, and I'll say 99% of what we publish is free and available to anyone to look at and to, to reference. Uh, so you are welcome to do so, and we appreciate you for doing so. Um, for our team, we have tons of tips and tricks from our commonly used applications and platforms on campus to uh, the, the nitty gritty that you might be working on to how to comply 
uh, with our policy or do's and don'ts, uh, tips and tricks, best practices for hosting meetings. We have lists of our tools and resources. So our tools that crawl our website uh, and can crawl your website at Harvard and help provide automated uh, reports on accessibility. And when you're ready for a deeper dive, tools that you can use to help assess the accessibility of your website, uh, both manually and automatically. We have tools that integrate with our learning management system, Canvas, uh, newly available to all of our academic partners across the university that can help say, is my course content accessible? So we provide lots of tools and resources available to you to help make sure you can deliver accessible content uh, to any audience, whether they be faculty, staff, or students. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our training. So uh, our team has uh, 10 standard trainings that we offer on a regular basis every four to six weeks for most of them uh, on things ranging from how to create accessible documents or slide decks, PDF documents, about our policies, testing your content for accessibility, uh, or getting really technical for our, our developers on campus. Uh, anything you can think of, we have a training for it, uh, including uh, Canvas that I just mentioned earlier for our academic audiences. We wanna make it easy and seamless for you to author accessible, inclusive content. And our standing rule uh, is that our team can train anyone on campus and we will come to a custom session for you if you'll get at least 10 people together for us, right? As long as you can get a, a small quorum, you and a partner office that you want, uh, we will come run a custom session of any of our trainings for you. Uh, it's free of charge to your department, making sure that you know how to make content accessible. That's one of the, the ways that we try to make it as easy as we can to live up to our, our policy, yes, but more than our policy, our commitment to make our university IT and our university content uh, accessible to everybody, especially uh, people with disabilities. One of the uh, key tenets that we always say about our policy and our efforts is that everyone, no matter what we do at Harvard, has a role to play in making our digital presence more accessible. Whether uh, you are a professor or a vice president or a coordinator for a department, there is something that you can do to make your part of Harvard more inclusive. And we try to make it more inclusive, yes, to share with the world so that they can consume all the awesome stuff that's produced, but because we also want the contributions of people with disabilities, roughly one in five people in the world having some form of disability, we're missing out if we're not including and getting the contributions of those members as well. Everybody has a role to play, whether they be staff, faculty, or students with disabilities. Uh, <clears throat> and we would like to uh, recognize some of our colleagues that have done a great job taking their role at Harvard and uh, playing to the best of their ability, if you will, to um, share accessibility and promote accessibility. Uh, the, one of the groups we're gonna talk about uh, happens to be able to share it with the world given what they do. Um, so uh, if you have not seen, um, we will uh, share links and references after today. Uh, but our homepage in the past year has been featured, harvard.edu, about accessibility. And the team that created the website, the uh, team from HPAC, Harvard Public Affairs and Communications, called it the Accessible World. And the tagline said, an accessible world is a better world for everyone. And honestly, I could not agree more. <laughs> uh, we absolutely think that is uh, true. And they did a great job of highlighting uh, ways that a website can be made more accessible. And members of our team uh, helped highlight ways a website can be made more accessible. But the wonderful thing that they did is they took authentic stories from members of the Harvard community and showed how their teaching and research and work 
was promoting accessibility and or being done by people with disabilities. So the accessible world was not projecting outward. It was authentically representing uh, community members with disabilities at Harvard doing their work, sharing their research and teaching with the world. The accessible world includes those people with disabilities. So um, <clears throat> we want to give a shout out uh, to members of the team that worked on the website. So uh, bear with me while I have my list here. Uh, William Cannon, uh, Ashley Simmons, Candace Kang, Molly Miles, Aaron Baker, and Melissa Laseca uh, from our HPAC content strategy team. So. Um, I think at least some of them are here today. Is that correct? Somebody? So come on up, Melissa, <laughs> on behalf of your team. And uh, we have a, a small memento of our appreciation for the HPAC content strategy team and their great work. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I told her she had to, to come up and be prepared to see people, but not for why. So, you know, we wanted like a small element of surprise, but not total shock. Um, so this says, uh, for excellence in promoting digital accessibility at Harvard, the accessible world to the HPAC content strategy team. Melissa is our director of that team. Uh, and then Gad for uh, May 18th, 2023. So, so well earned. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, I can't tell you how many people uh, reached out and said, wow, it's so amazing that uh, Harvard.edu uh, is featuring and promoting uh, people with disabilities and accessibility work and the impact that it had on them in their corners of the world. So uh, kudos to Melissa and to your team uh, for all of the great work that you do. Um, next, to introduce our uh, guest speaker, I'm going to introduce our new uh, leader of our team in digital accessibility, uh, who is the Chief Information Security and Data Privacy Officer at the university, Michael Tran Duff. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It sure is wonderful to see so many people join us today, both in person and online. And I, I couldn't be happier to be a part of this event today and this amazing team that you're, you're hearing from. But let's talk about why we're here. The purpose of Global Accessibility Awareness Day is to get everyone thinking and talking and learning about digital access and inclusion. To reinvigorate each year, our support for the more than 1 billion people worldwide with disabilities or impairments. Think about that. That's one in eight individuals on the planet. It's far more common than most people realize. And as we heard from Alexis a little bit earlier, uh, Harvard is strongly committed to accessibility and we view accessibility as fundamental to Harvard's culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, which is why we are honored today that to celebrate this day, we are joined in person here in Cambridge, right on this stage by its co-founder, Jenison Assumption. Jenison co-founded Global Accessibility Awareness Day in 2012. Since then, its celebrations have blossomed and expanded each year. And building on that momentum, a couple of years ago on the 10th anniversary of this day, Jenison co-founded the GAD Foundation with the mission to disrupt the culture of technology and digital product development to include accessibility as a core requirement. 
accessibility as a core requirement. Jenison has been working in digital accessibility since way back in 2006, beginning with the Royal Bank of Canada's IT accessibility team. And then in 2013, he was recruited into Silicon Valley to join LinkedIn, where he serves as LinkedIn's head of accessibility engineering evangelism. In 2020, Business Insider named Jenison one of 30 power players helping new CEO Ryan Rosansky, Roslansky run LinkedIn. On the academic front, Jenison co-directs the Adapt Tech Research Network based at Dawson College in Montreal, where he has been conducting and publishing research on technology used by Canadian post-secondary students with disabilities since back in 1997. But Jenison, I wanna thank you for spending part of the day that you co-founded here with us and Harvard welcomes you. I'm gonna say a few words about Kyle here. You might, uh, you, do you want to go ahead and sit down together? Okay, why don't we do that? Okay, yeah. Now we we heard from we heard from Kyle a bit earlier, but I want to give him a proper introduction as we get started uh, with fireside chat here. So Kyle Shackmut is directors at Harvard's director of digital accessibility, provide, providing strategic direction to digital accessibility efforts across the university. He led, as you heard earlier, he led the creation of our digital accessibility services team, and he collaborates with the university leadership to formulate university policy in digital accessibility. Prior to that, he focused on a universal de design approach, integrating accessibility into at scale learning experiences at, uh, through Harvard and X. Kyle does a lot outside of Harvard. So beyond Harvard, Kyle is the co-chair of the Educause IT Accessibility Community Group, which is the largest affinity group for accessibility professionals in higher ed. In that capacity, he led a team that integrated accessibility into a security and privacy risk assessment tool called the HECVAT. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's used by hundreds of schools uh, worldwide and by numerous vendors. In 2021, Kyle received Educause's Rising Star Award. This is a big deal because this is an award that's, that's bestowed on only one or two people a year out of across tens of thousands of technology professionals throughout higher ed. And on top of all that, Kyle speaks and writes about matters relating to digital accessibility, public policy, technology, and education, and universal design. So we're very fortunate to have two distinguished experts and evangelists with us today. We're gonna get started on this. Once Jenison and Kyle conclude their discussion, we're gonna open the floor to questions. For those of you here in the room, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone over to you so everyone can hear you online. And for those joining via Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of the screen. I think is where you'll find it. For our Q&A today, in the back of the room, we've, we've got two moderators that are gonna help us out. Uh, Janelle Sims, Manager of Digital Accessibility and Derek Jackson, Manager of Dig Digital Accessibility Development. Without further ado, let's go to our panel. Over to you. All right, thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, Jenison, so um, thanks again for joining us here today in, in Cambridge. Um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, a lot going on around the, the globe as it relates to digital accessibility. Um, could you take us back? The, how, did, how did this start? Sure. First of all, uh, it's great to be here. This is my first in-person GAD event uh, that I've attended since you know what uh, <laughs> and you know when. Um, so I'm, it's just great to be here in the Howard Halls of, of Harvard for this. Um, so I started my digital accessibility career back in 2006, and ever since I started, I was fascinated with finding 
different ways to make accessibility much more approachable for your everyday technology professional. Because I was dealing with a lot of folks, engineers, designers uh, at the bank, many of whom had never been, uh, had never had to deal with accessibility, frankly, before. Mm -hmm. And the usual, you know, a lot of it is just talking to them, demonstrating, et cetera, et cetera. But I figured that there has to be a way to, to do this in different ways. And then I, I came upon this event in Washington, D.C., called Accessibility Camp DC at the MLK Public Library. And I flew to DC and it was just this Saturday. They had no agenda. They just brought people together with the promise of pizza and discussions of all kinds on accessibility. The energy in the room was amazing. I said, I've got to do something like this back in Toronto. It took me a couple of years. Uh, 2011, I did that. And so I was, I was already on that way. You know, I'd helped with um, Accessibility Unconference here in Boston in 2010, and there was something in Seattle as well. So I was already on that road of just like getting people out there and just getting people to have fun and to learn about accessibility and to eat. Uh, the power of pizza. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we use that a lot on college campuses. Well, see? So we're familiar. Uh, then it happened by chance that I was at home on this random Saturday evening in November of 2011 uh, and doing what technology people do, just trolling Twitter and seeing what was going on. And I came upon this auto-generated tweet that said something to the effect of accessibility need, needs to go mainstream now. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I activated that link uh, with my screen reader and came upon this blog post by someone I didn't know at the moment, uh, Joe Devon, who was a backend developer in Los Angeles. Just, he was basically, you know, he had a bee in his bonnet. So what do, what do people do? They get take to their blog. And he was talking all about how he was just frustrated that developers know nothing about accessibility. They don't even know what a screen reader is. And he was calling for a day, a global day, where people just learn about accessibility. And he just picked a date. He said, let's do it on May 9th. Let's do something. And I was like, this is a no-brainer. So I just, I, I, I just replied to his blog post um, and said, you know, like, great idea. This is what I'm up to. Like, if you're really serious about this, let's, let's do something. And uh, we got on the horn and uh, here we are 12 years later, celebrating our 12th year. It's, it's Joe and I never thought it was ever going to turn out to be something that it has become. Um, you know, at a certain point, at a certain point, it's just it, we built the platform and we just let people, uh, whether it's at Harvard or at HSBC in Hong Kong um, or a small little NGO tucked away somewhere, um, they want to talk about digital access and inclusion and do it on or around the date, the third Thursday of May. And um, it's made it. You know, I, I wasn't even sure during COVID what was going to happen. But even in 2020, I think on virtual events that were at least at that point, I think there were 200 then. We we're consistent around 200. We know that there's a lot more that happens that we don't know about until after the fact. Um, and what's really exciting to me is the number of events that are happening in different languages because G is global. And so uh, having uh, sessions in, in Cantonese and in Arabic and all kinds of other languages uh, spreading the word uh, is 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 amazing. That's really exciting, and it's it's so uh, cool how how expansively it's grown. Right, the the power of one small gathering over pizza to all around the world in a lot of different languages. Um, do you have any memories of what it was like the first year you celebrated Global Accessibility Awareness Day? Honestly, so <laughs> the first year I launched uh, a meetup group in Toronto. Uh, called Toronto, Accessib uh, Toronto Accessibility Inclusive Design, and it's still in existence today, A11YTO. And uh, it was such a long day that I was nodding off at, my, <laughs> at, at the kickoff of, of the meetup, and people were having to tap me on the shoulder to keep me awake. Uh, but because we were having events, and I was just like tuning in to things happening in Australia, which is, of course, the day before, uh, and all kinds of things. So I think... That, um, now, not much has changed uh, in terms of <laughs> uh, running on fumes. Uh, basically, I flew in from uh, the Bay Area last night, but I was following events as they were unfolding uh, in APEC um, while I was flying over here and uh, into this morning. 
I think I gave Kyle a little bit of a, a heart palpitation when I told him I was really late uh, because I got a little distracted uh, with uh, with some things. Um, one of the things we did this morning is we dropped uh, a wrap for Gav. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can talk about that after. But uh, yeah, but it's 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 just the energy of it is what keeps keeps me going. I know that's the same thing for Joe as well. Lots lots of demands on your time. And we're thrilled you're you're here today. We're totally on time. <laughs> um, tell us a little more about the what dropped today and the the music. Yeah. So so again, this is uh, under the whole group, uh, the whole concept of you know finding different ways to reach people, um, because the danger, of course, when we talk about accessibility is is we end up preaching to the choir, and really the the purpose of GAD is to is to reach the everyday person. So you know what better way to reach folks than something fun. Um, we have someone at uh, LinkedIn who uh, by day is, is an exceptional engineer, but he also uh, likes to rap. Uh, his name is Adam Walcock. And so I knew him uh, and I approached him uh, a couple of months ago and said, hey, you know, Global Accessibility Awareness Day is coming up. Would you consider um, like putting together a rap for this? And um, he and uh, Coop, um, is, is his partner. Um, they put together, they wrote up the rap, uh, which uh, of course they shared and, and we worked together on. And so it dropped this morning. Uh, we'll uh, make sure to get it out to folks. Uh, or you could, uh, I guess at this point, you could use your favorite search engine and type GAD, G-A-A-D, rap. And I, I think it should come up. Uh, it's it's on YouTube. We'll share it with folks. I will share it. Yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll get it out there. But again, it, it, it you know there, there's the full messages in there about different, like how accessibility is important, all that kind of good stuff. But it's just done in in a, in a non-threatening way. Then just have fun. We'll have a new soundtrack for our like trainings. Yeah, uh, do it. On the, Use the it. Absolutely, right. We'll have some mood music when the Zoom starts, and you know it's. I have all the, the different genres represented in it. It's really cool. So uh, it started as uh, you nodding off in a meeting 12 years ago, right? It's grown into this uh, huge worldwide phenomenon. Um, you see a lot of companies will make accessibility related like product announcements or, or time kind of some of their release cycles around uh, celebrating this day. Uh, academic institutions right here at Harvard celebrating what we do. There's a lot. Um, where do you want this to be in like five years or 10 years? Do you, can you imagine uh, how this is going to keep growing? It's great. I just, where, where I'd like to see it grow is, as I mentioned uh, before, is the, 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 the G and the global piece. Like I'd love to see uh, as many of this, of the, and we have again, over 200 events this year that we, that we know of. Most of them are in English. I'd like to have us like have many more sessions in languages other than English, uh, talking about digital accessibility. Um, I know you're probably going to ask me about this after, but through the foundation, you know, we're, we're going to get um, you know more stuff happening on a, on a more uh, you know throughout the year. But for GAD itself, I, I, I see I see that area as growing um, that that outside of the English realm. And then just other other things like gaming has been such a huge uh, push during GAD. All the gaming studios, which to me is amazing, because as important as it is, and we can talk here forever about making places like Harvard, um, large corporations, making all of those things accessible. Gaming is about having fun. We want the fun stuff yeah. too. <laughs> and when you think about people with certain disabilities or impairments who cannot leave the house. Gaming has become a way to be connected. And what's really neat about gaming is people can choose not to necessarily disclose that they have a disability or impairment. So, so long as that game is made to be accessible, they are playing on an equal playing field. And, I, and, and, just to, and, and I've seen this over the last few years um, that gaming studios have really upped their game, particularly around the day of GAD to make announcements and things like that. Really cool, a widening reach and 
right? We want all areas of society, right? We're very invested in education and what we do for education and career readiness, but yeah, the, the fun stuff should be accessible too. Uh, you mentioned a little bit, and Michael did in your intro, but how, how did you get started in doing accessibility? Was this what you wanted to do from the time you were five or how did, how did you get your start in, uh, in accessibility? So I think when I became interested was I attended uh, back in Canada, I attended a, a summer program uh, where they brought together 24 blind and visually impaired uh, youth um, to learn about basically different technologies that could help us. Now, I fortunately had had access, uh, living in a big city, had had access to a screen reader and uh, even a braille display um, when I was in high school and things like that. But witnessing other students um, coming from smaller towns, some of them who have never had an opportunity to use screen enlargement software or to use a screen reader, that had a profound impact on me. And I knew then that I, I was interested in something to do with technology and empowering people with disabilities. Now, I thought, well, the way to get there was to become a computer scientist. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that wasn't going to be the route that was going to be most successful for me. So I was like, okay, well, let me, I got to figure things out. And so, you know, I was doing research in uh, accessibility, as, as was mentioned in the introduction in, in grad school. But then I went off and did some other stuff um, professionally, um, but I was still keeping my toe in, in accessibility. And obviously it was important to me because I'm an end user consumer and benefactor of it. But um, in 2006, I quit my job. At the time I was a project manager doing e-learning implementations. I quit my job without a parachute um, just so I could figure out what I wanted to do next. And uh, my friends were like, well, like, why, why do you keep resisting doing the accessibility thing? And, and so I said, well, okay, let me give it a try. Now, my thing was, though, I had no background. No, I wasn't an engineer, and I certainly had no QA experience. So I was going to interviews uh, back in Toronto, and they were asking me about, like, talk to us about, like, how you use these different QA processes. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to waste your time. Uh, I have none of this experience. Um, so... Those interviews didn't last that long. Now, fortunately, as, as my life typically is, things just happen. And my resume ended up on the desk of the manager of the IT accessibility team at Canada's largest bank, that being RBC. And what was supposed to be a half hour interview uh, turned out to be a three hour conversation, uh, in which I like to mention that I missed a haircut appointment uh, for. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that ended up becoming a six and a half year job um, where I basically learned everything. I became much more technically uh, savvy. I, I became very comfortable talking to web and mobile developers, uh, learning the lingo of designers. Uh, I helped build uh, uh, RBC's uh, procurement um, program and all of those things. Um, so that's basically how I got started. It's really awesome. I always uh, give a short quip when people ask. I just got into this out of self-interest, and then it turned into to a, a career. Um, how, how have things changed uh, from then to now, right? So that was 10, 15 years ago. Technology evolves. The waves we're implementing accessibility evolved. What's, what's different about uh, doing it in 2023? I think for me personally, what, what I've seen different is there's just there seems to be a lot more enthusiasm and interest and 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 of course i'm going to be subjective working at a company uh, like linkedin where our our mission we're, we're driven by creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce and so people who come to work there obviously believe in that and so the engineers and designers that i'm working with understand that by making their stuff accessible, we're moving the needle. Everyone understands the unemployment rate of people with disabilities and how atrocious that is. And so what I've noticed in just the time I've been at LinkedIn, and it's, it's going to be my 10-year anniversary this November, is just the passion that the engineers are bringing to it. Not that necessarily there wasn't the same passion 
at the bank, it, but but that's different, right? It's like we're we're trying to get people to buy our products uh, in a bank. Here, we we just want to help people find a job uh, and to grow their career. And so, I, I've just that that in itself is something that I've noticed that's different. Now, on the technology front, certainly you know test automation, AI, all those buzzwords. <laughs> it's all great. You know, it certainly made my job a lot easier because I can at least point to, you know, we were, we're in the process of implementing test automation throughout, you know, the, the into our testing pipelines and all of that kind of stuff. But it really is about the excitement that engineers and, and designers, and engineers in particular, because I sit within engineering, they understand, first of all, that developing accessibly is part of their craft as an engineer. Because who wants to ship code that has bugs in it? I mean, and that's essentially what you're doing if you're not developing accessibly. You're, you're, you're shipping buggy code and it's, you're basically building up tech debt that someone else is gonna have to clean up later. So by, by framing it that way, by getting engineers to understand that this is part of their craft, um, you know, that gets them excited. It's building that culture, um, which is so important. So I can just go on and on, but, uh, but that's like, that's- For three like, hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but that seems like, that seems to be like, like the big thing. And again, like I said, um, can't ignore all the technology that has changed, that has made our jobs. I, I think you'd agree with me too, Kyle. It's just made our jobs and the conversations we have a lot easier because we can point to tools that will help. That, that won't replace the manual testing that unfortunately still has to be done, but we'll hopeful with AI and computer vision uh, and maybe some smart folks here at Harvard, um, computer scientists who can help us bridge that gap and, and create some of the tooling that will make things, again, that much easier for more engineers to develop accessibly. Absolutely, I would I would agree. Night and day, even from five years ago, and, and certainly ten years ago, in uh, the conversations we have with people, and how uh, when we can talk about accessibility and the ways that accessibility is implemented on devices they use every day, whether it be for work or for fun, right? It it makes accessibility more real in a way that fifteen or twenty years ago it might have been uh, some abstract or really. Uh, piece of technology that you've never seen or heard of. And when it's something that's in your pocket or something that's connected to your TV at home uh, and those things involve accessibility as well, I, I think it makes it more real yeah. to someone that might not be an expert yeah. for sure. When you're talking uh, with these engineers, whether it be LinkedIn or through the, the GAD Foundation um, about accessibility, how, how do you describe the, the awesomeness that is accessibility to someone that doesn't know, right? You might be preaching to some of the choir here and folks who work on accessibility, uh, like you mentioned, but when you're talking to someone for the first time, like why accessibility? What's, what's your pitch? I, I think rather than speaking, I think the power is in the demonstrating. And every time, whether it's uh, at LinkedIn, when I first came to LinkedIn all those years ago and did a demo to them, or any number of demos uh, that I've done over the years at other technology companies. You know, we could talk all we want about the guidelines and standards and how important it is and all of that stuff. But when an engineer or designer actually sees their product or their site or their app being used and showing the good and mm, the <laughs> stuff that might need some love, uh, when they see that, that's, that's the lights on moment where they go and get it. And, and that will always, always be to me the, what sells it. I don't have to say anything else usually, except just to show it. And you can find so many examples online and things like that. Now, I, I wanna be clear, it has nothing at all whatsoever to do with shame. It just has to do with just, because people in the main, First of all, most people have never interacted with a person with a disability before. And the idea of people with disabilities using what they've built for, for some people is just something that they haven't thought of. And that's, you know, it is what it is. But when they get a chance to actually see it in action, 
that's that's when the magic happens. Um, and sure, you know, there'll be some situations where the conversations can get a little spicy, um, you know, and 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 timelines, trade-offs, excessive. There's always going to be trade-offs, and I'm not I'm the I'm not someone who is looking for perfection. Um, you know, it's a, it's about over time. And let's see what we can get done now. And let's put a plan in, in place for the near term and longer term. Um, as a recovering project manager, um, <laughs> I, I, I get it. I totally understand. As long as you're willing to walk along on the journey and understand that this, this stuff is, are things that need to get done, then things will work out. Other, otherwise, you know, that's, that's, that's other conversations that have to happen. But nine times out of 10, that, like I said, the demonstration over, over the speaking to me is the first place I would go. Sure. I find it interesting, and I find it at Harvard and, and everywhere else I've worked, where so often it'll be the case, too, that the people that, as you said, champion accessibility first and foremost are people that know or have worked with someone with a disability, either because they had a teammate or because they have a child or a coworker or a cousin that has some sort of accessibility need and they kind of um, or yeah, or they frankly they internalize it, yeah, right? Uh, or they frankly may have a a, hit, um, a non visible disability or impairment themselves. Um, Eighty percent of folks with disabilities or impairments around the world have disabilities or impairments that are unseen. Or non visible. So it's 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 you know it's all kinds of folks who are who are the initial champions. But I have to say, I have had situations where the conversations started um, differently um, in the beginning, and those folks have become the most ardent champions once they understand. Absolutely, and uh, I certainly find a lot of people they. They want to understand or don't want to intentionally uh, exclude folks once they once they learn that they may have been right. So um, we'll we'll uh, switch here and ask some questions of the audience here in just a minute. Uh, you mentioned your project manager uh, background and working with engineers, and everybody probably has a, a backlog, you know, that will go from here to Silicon Valley, uh, stretching with with what they can do. Um, so when someone's facing a, a real uphill battle or a, a lot that they need to tackle when it comes to accessibility, how do you help people frame the big picture and uh, tackle uh, the right thing first? Right. Well, and, and, and I, I mentioned this before, but, but it's, it's good to mention here again. Um, the, always the danger is once, once you open this up, people are like, um, oh, well, we have to get this all done. And it's, it's this whole boil the ocean uh, syndrome that ends up happening. And part of it is just really like laser focus on what are, what, are the, what are the most impactful things that can be done right away. And it might only be one or two things and you have to be all right with that. It can't be everything. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that's why everyone always says, you know, you can't make everything a blocking uh, ticket, right? Otherwise, there's nothing else. So you have to make those tough choices and prioritize what's what's really a blocker, what's a critical, and 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 work your way through it. I'm talking about backlogs here, but but <laughs> even when you're just talking about like plans, you know, everyone wants to create the most inclusive uh, environment everywhere, and I get that, but. Um, doing it in realistic chunks is really where it's going to work. Otherwise, you're always going to be off by, 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 by a step. You're not going to hit your milestones. So I, again, like I said, I talk to people about, let, let's see, like, okay, I know you want to get these 10 things done. You're only going to get four done this year. What are those? And then let's work our way that way. Now, obviously, sometimes circumstances can't always dictate that you can only do certain things. But, but but again, like you really need to look like what is the end goal? And, and, and here's the, the reality. Accessibility will always, there will always be trade-offs. It's never going to be the most important thing to everyone. Sense. 
Um, last question before we pull in uh, Janelle and Derek to moderate our Q and A. Um, so you you've talked to the engineers, you've got them on board. Uh, they're into accessibility. How do you keep up with 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 evolving technology? What's the latest thing? Where to learn stuff? Of course, beyond like LinkedIn and Harvard's awesome accessibility resources, but beyond those, where where how do you stay up to date with what to know and accessibility? Um, I, I you know I attend conferences like like uh, like a lot of other folks. Um, you know. Uh, all over the social media, uh, checking all of those things out. Um, you know, accessibility is not unlike other technology things uh, that people kind of gravitate to, podcasts, uh, tech publications, uh, influencers, things like that. So I, I would say I, I follow accessibility trends the same way anyone in this room would follow uh, their own tech trends, podcasts, um, people I respect, uh, conferences, all of those different uh, avenues. Great. Um, well, thank you for being here and, and sharing that. Um, we'd love to open it up to our audience. So uh, Janelle and Derek, I think you've got some questions for us queued up from the group. Are there any questions? And maybe while we're waiting for that, if I could just plug uh, the website accessibility.day for those who want to learn more, including seeing the blog post that Joe wrote. Um, the foundation, you can go to gaad.foundation. We just announced this morning or last night, uh, something, uh, our nominations are now open for something that we're calling the Gaddies. These are awards <laughs> that we are going to be giving out uh, in uh, November. Uh, the first awards we'll be giving out in San Francisco. And therefore, uh, projects that have basically are living and breathing the mission and vision of the foundation, uh, which is essentially to disrupt the uh, culture of digital product development uh, to make accessibility a core requirement. So uh, check that out. Who knows? There might be a particular project here at Harvard that uh, might be uh, uh, might be interesting to submit. So I'll leave that with you folks. Awesome. So I think we had a question in the middle. Is that right? Hi, Janison. Hey. Uh, Michael Elko. I'm an accessibility product manager with ServiceNow. And um, I just wanted to ask a question. Actually, you just answered a question about the Gaddies, <laughs> which was fantastic. You just dropped that about uh, yesterday. But as a product manager, um, I know you said the... Uh, accessibility is always a trade-off, and that's something I've always experienced in the company. And I want to know, uh, you know, how do you work out, and what was your process in working out um, negotiations? I guess <laughs> right with, with with the teams and and making sure that is a priority. Right, and and as I mentioned there, myself. Um, yeah, that's, it is tough, right? And part of it is like finding, you know, say you have a backlog and, and just figuring out, okay, you have like 30 blockers. Like what is the work effort here to, to get these all done? And then you pair, you know, you start pairing it back. Like let, let's get these 10 done now. Let's, 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 let's get them scheduled in the next, in the upcoming sprints. And while we're at it, you know, let's, 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 start making accessibility part of the definition of done. And so that accessibility isn't something that's surprising people. Um, you know, it, for most people, it, it is a surprise at the beginning um, in a project, but as you start building that muscle uh, and getting people to think about it throughout the project life cycle, then, then, then as they get to their next project, they'll be saying like, oh, like we need to start budgeting for accessibility and thinking about it more. Um, so yeah, part of it is just, um, like I said, first of all, like it, assuming that someone is, is just dealing with accessibility as it sometimes is the case, a few, like really close to launch, right? Um, <laughs> uh, really, really, really leaning in on like, okay, what, what are those, what are those big blocking items? Let's, let's get those all buttoned down first. Sure. We've got all these other things. Let's, let, let's get those other pieces scheduled. And then let's start looking long-term at how do we build this muscle? How do we start 
integrating accessibility more from uh, project kickoff. Awesome, thank you. Sure. And I know Janelle, it looks like there might be some questions online. Um, yeah, there's been some great questions about digital accessibility services and our resources. Um, so we've been answering those in the chat, but we did get one um, from someone who's really happy to join us uh, virtually on this special day. Um, for Jenison and Kyle, um, you mentioned how you follow tech trends through social media. Do you have any podcast or blog post recommendations for us? Kyle? Uh, I feel like I'm knee deep in reading academic articles these days, a little less exciting uh, to share on social media, depending on your research interests, you know. Um, like Jenison, I I, re I love reading and, and contributing to and talking to like trade specific publications. So um, what are like the different education um, resources uh, about accessibility? I'm a shameless plug that Michael mentioned earlier, the Educause community group. It's a group of practitioners, uh, maybe not what you might formally consider a social network, but a very social network uh, that shares tips and resources related to accessibility in technology all the time. That's certainly where I get a ton of crowdsourced uh, accessibility knowledge and things that are very specific to the work that we do in higher education. Um, so that's certainly uh, one of the, the greatest resources I'm really privileged to be plugged into is just a, a community of people uh, that do this work, uh, sharing resources and tips and tricks. That's one of the things I love most about accessibility is um, even sometimes working in a, a space where you might have a, a competitor in a, the corporate world or a peer institution, like nobody really hides accessibility knowledge or expertise, right? It's people are so uh, sharing and open with how they get their work done uh, and make improvements related to accessibility. But how about you? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to uh, David Kennedy, who puts out a, a weekly uh, e-newsletter called A11Y Weekly, A11Y Weekly, uh, which is packed full of amazing stuff. Uh, and just honestly, like following the A11Y hashtag on your social media platform of, cho of, of choice. Um, of course, I'm going to say also following the accessibility hashtag on LinkedIn. Uh, has, uh, there's a lot of good professional um, stuff that that's shared through there. I know there's also an A11Y Slack channel that a lot of people like to follow. Um, so yeah, those those are some other really uh, neat places um, to uh, to keep up to date. And that's online. We should also mention, right? Um, there are accessibility groups that meet up all around the world. Oh yeah. Uh, and so there's no substitution, like Janice said, conferences. But even there's one here in, in Boston. Me, I was just going to say uh, the Boston Accessibility Group. They've got a meeting tonight uh, that they're hosting all about uh, accessibility, uh, global accessibility awareness yeah. day. And so um, you know. Yes, social media and uh, online is a great way, but many of those are, have also in-person analogous communities. Um, and then you get the benefit of great expertise uh, and cool people that you get to meet. No, absolutely. I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Bay Area Accessibility and Inclusive Design, which I co-lead. Um, but if you uh, use your favorite search engine, type the word meetup and accessibility, you'll probably find... Uh, you know, for folks virtually, you'll find uh, potentially a meetup group in your city. And if you don't have one, start one. Our Boston leaders are uh, Derek on the stage and Eric, who's uh, in the back members of our team. Other questions? Hi, this is Bob Dolan with Diverse Learners Consulting and also the Harvard Business School. Um, on the eve of WCAG 2.2 coming out, finally, I'm just curious what some what are some of the WCAG 3 efforts that you've each found most exciting and are most looking forward to? Huh. Well, I, I, I will say, and, and the W3C will also say that uh, 3.0 is, is years away. Um, I think for myself, I am looking forward to 2.2 becoming uh, finalized and published. And, and uh, the latest word is that that will be coming out in the July to September timeframe. 
Um, and I think what's neat about 2.2 is that a lot of it is just putting into, uh, is codifying what was already in 2.1 that was unspoken. Um, and so, you know, I think I think what what people will will find that they're going to like about two dot two are, are kind of like the missing pieces where people were like in two dot one oh you know like why didn't we men why didn't they mention this or that and so uh, I, I think I, I think it's going to be worth the wait uh, for 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 uh, for two dot two so look forward to that um, three dot oh there's a, there's a lot that's moving there's a lot of moving parts so I'm going to defer making any comment. This is my, uh, did I tell you I did a bachelor's in political science? So, um, I'm going to defer there uh, because I know that they are, you know, there, there's definitely a framework and there's uh, things happening with 3.0, but I think uh, I, I'd like to give them some more time to, uh, first of all, I'd like to see 2.2 .2 out the door uh, before looking too far ahead to, to 3.0. Kyle, did you have anything? For uh, I I followed some of them. Um, I I think, like Janison said, they're years away. Uh, if we're being really honest, in in partnering with a lot of vendor partners that we have, I'd love to see people working on two dot one and not two dot oh, right? <laughs> and uh, we always like to point out when someone's like, "We're we're trying to meet WCAG two dot oh, that uh, that's a standard from two thousand eight that doesn't acknowledge the existence of mobile devices. So, like, <laughs> can we aim a little higher uh, when we're working on accessibility? So. Uh, the standards are really important, right? Because they're they're the technical nuts and bolts that we follow. Um, but uh, you know, I think we're going to get there with with two dot two coming out soon. Um, but there's a lot of work still to be done on training people to, to to meet the requirements that we have today as well. Thank you. Janelle's got another question from the online audience. Yes. Oh, first of all, one comment just as a follow up to. Um, Kyle's mentioning uh, Educause IT Access. Um, this person just wanted to say it's a superb group, and Kyle modestly neglects to mention that he co chairs the group to excellent effect. His leadership is a big part of the group's value. So, nice shout out to well, Kyle. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, and then we have another uh, question that's been upvoted a couple of times. Um, it's, quote, the obligatory question about AI. <laughs> Do you view it as a mostly positive thing in terms of the future of digital accessibility? How do you think about it in terms of navigating people's biases, for example, racism or sexism remaining a problem with AI due to the society we live in? I think what's most exciting about AI right now is we are in a position to influence it and to influence the change. It's, it's not, nothing set in stone right this second. You know, um, if anyone's following, the people are also cautioning about AI and people going a little out of control with developing this and that right the second. So we're still in this in this stage where all of us who care about, you know, it was mentioning about bias and 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 ex potential exclusion of people with disabilities. Now is our time to speak up and to get involved. Um, so I, I think, I think this is, this is the, the perfect time. Am I excited about it? I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Um, I, I wouldn't say like, I'm, I, you know, my, 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 my co-founding partner and brother in arms in, uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, Joe Devin, shout out to him. Um, you know, you couldn't get someone more excited uh, than him around AI, um, and, 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 and the possibilities. I'm, I'm more, uh, kind of cautiously watching on the sidelines and, and reading up and learning more. But yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, like I mentioned before, te like uh, test, test automation, the fact that test automation now can only pick up a, a certain number of accessibility types of violations and that there's still so much manual uh, accessibility testing, that, testing that's required. You know, certainly AI, will will be able to help us out there we just need to be we need to be thoughtful about the way we 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 go about it we absolutely need to make sure from the modeling perspective that we do include folks with disabilities and impairments as part of those models um, i keep hearing these stories about you know these these interviews that are now being done by like these virtual 
but nobody's right. Your first interview is going to be with this thing. And, uh, you know, that's going to apparently like the danger is like, if you're not making eye contact, it'll ding you on that. Well, I I'd be in trouble, right? Because I, you'd have to, you know, it's, it's for tougher for someone like myself, uh, completely blind and such to be making perfect eye contact. So what's going to happen if I'm dealing with this, this virtual interviewer. So yeah, there's definitely questions that need to be asked, answered, but I don't think we're far enough down the road that, that, that we're in trouble. So if you care about the issues, now's the time for every, all of us to be speaking up and, and getting involved and finding out like, and asking that question everywhere and always, well, what, are, what about accessibility? What are you doing there? Or uh, are you including people with disabilities in your, in your models? Yeah, I was gonna say the mantra, right? For yeah. the disability rights movement, forever, nothing about us without yep. us, or just nothing without us. Yep. And um, that that's exactly what Jenison's talking about with AI, right? Making sure that those of us who have disabilities or allies of those that have disabilities are, are a part of that conversation, including those doing research mm -hmm. um, in these areas. Um, I'm sure everybody's played with the the different like mm -hmm. chat GPTs out there, right? The, the AI du jour, but um, you know, it, it reflects back to us what we have in the world. And sometimes that's great and inspiring. And sometimes if you ask it to describe a person with a disability, you can get all of the same uh, tropes or negative perceptions that society has of people with disabilities today, right now. Um, and so it's, it's up to us to stay involved in that conversation early and often uh, to, to keep things moving in a positive direction because there's so much potential uh, for what we can do, um, but we don't want all of that potential to be unleashed in harmful ways or ways that exclude or ways that don't include the, the perspectives of people with disabilities. Do we have any more? Oh, we have a question, another question that we answered. Way in the back. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Corina Marg. Uh, I'm learning to become a front-end developer. Um, for me, uh, being able to build like a sex of accessible sites is personal. I used to be a high school math teacher, so I'm thinking about, you know, my student who was colorblind or my student who uh, relied on a screen reader to access the web. Uh, but unfortunately, I find that it's been much easier to advance my, let's say, JavaScript skills or HTML, CSS, and it's been to advance my knowledge on how to build accessible websites. You might know that, you know, uh, web developers have great communities, so it's easy to find somebody to give feedback on a code I wrote for a page or a website, uh, but they would be looking for, I don't know, pixel perfect design or maybe responsive design. And often they, if I would ask, okay, how about accessibility? They would say, what do you mean? Like, well, what am I supposed to look for? So what I would personally find really useful as a, you know, entry level aspiring developer is, you know, opportunities for mentorship from, you know, people who are already established in the, you know, accessibility community. And I was wondering if you know any resources um, or any ways to, um, um, to have access to that kind of mentorship. Thank you. Sure. Um, no, that that's that's an important um, that's an important aspect of it. The, there's a couple of things I'll say on this. There, like from you were saying about it, like learning. Fortunately, there's a lot of um, good material online now that like uh, different companies. I, I won't name any here, but um, but there are some good companies out there that put free free and sometimes paid courses online around like fundamentals of accessibility from a technical from a technical perspective um there's also now uh it's not so new anymore but you there is an uh, opportunity to become certified as an accessibility professional uh, and um, separately uh, or as part of that uh, as a web accessibility specialist which will really hone your skills in that and that's put through an organization called the international association of accessibility professionals but outside of that, um, certainly, you know, the, what's really neat about the accessibility community is, and I've heard anecdotally, and I know, I know this to be true myself, is that many of us uh, are very approachable um, through social media and such. 
and uh, so people are, uh, can reach out uh, and 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 see if if someone has time to be a mentor. Um, that that's something I enjoy, certainly enjoy doing. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of of folks out there who would be willing to uh, to do that kind of thing as well. Um, so part of it is just finding um, you know engineers who are working on it, like whether you look on uh, any, anywhere, like it, it's interesting, Stack Overflow or, or even some, I, apparently there's some active Reddit threads on accessibility, but just finding someone who you think, um, you know, you, you agree with their, their position or you like the way that they, they write or things like that, and they seem to know their thing around accessibility, just approach them and see, you know, if they'd be willing to meet uh, or to mentor uh, you, uh, inaccessibility, I think, is 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 a good way to go. I don't know, Kyle, if you have any other ideas. Yeah, and and then um, so online, great. And then, like we mentioned earlier, uh, local meetups or conferences are great places to meet mentors. Many mentors that I've had over the years, I've met uh, at like a, a Boston accessibility meetup or at a you know accessing higher ground conference or something like that, where it's um, people interested that are already interested in what you're doing. And they go to those kind of things to meet people and to share ideas. Uh, and so those are great places to, to meet in a, a friendly environment uh, that's open, open and welcoming to people. You don't have to be an expert to go. Uh, they're really excited to see new people at, at any of those kind of things. Great question, though. Thanks for asking. I think we've got some more online questions. Um, yeah, we have one. Actually, it came in from William Cannon, who is one of the recipients of the Harvard Accessibility in the World Award we gave earlier. Um, so William asks that sometimes examples are a helpful way to explore best practices. Are there high traffic websites you think are doing a great job with accessibility? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jenison. I think Harvard.edu does a great job with accessibility, William. So kudos to you for that. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it really, it varies a lot, right? Um, people ask me a lot about like uh, news websites or other things, which are a pain for a whole bunch of reasons, right? So only some of which are related to accessibility. But um, like I'll often read things via like RSS on the web or something. And that's probably how very few people might be experiencing um, a website. So in, I'm, I don't know if I have a high traffic website, uh, great example to point to. I always love when people ask of examples, uh, one that I always use to, to plug some, some colleagues on the internet. Uh, and what they do is the accessible university website that we use when we train folks, because uh, it mocks up some examples of things that we all have all the time on university websites. Uh, and then shows an accessible version and an inaccessible version, and then gives you a, a demo and a key to how uh, things are different in one versus the other, and gives you an opportunity to really pick it apart. I know I've trained before where I'll be uh, showing an, an issue like on NewYorkTimes.com or whatever it might be, and then uh, the next month I'm running a training and like they fixed it. And I mean, great, right? <laughs> like let's fix all the accessibility issues, but then the issue I was trying to demonstrate wasn't available. Um, so the, those tend to be the areas I like to send people to find static examples of things, uh, since there's often a really dynamic environment. How about you? The uh, folks at the W3C um, have a, a, a site called the before and after demonstration, where they show, you know, as, as it sounds, the before and after, what happens once you do implement the web content accessibility guidelines. As a, as a way of finding examples, I think that that's a really neat one um, because it is, is exactly that. So if you use your favorite search engine and plug in W3C uh, before and after demonstration and then the word accessibility, um, I'm 99% sure that will pop up. And mine was a similar one. It was from uh, University of Washington. And then there's another similar one from uh, Duke that have done similar work. Got time for one or two more? Yeah. I mean, any other questions? Or actually, I do. Oh, here we go. We got another question in front. Uh, 
Bob Dolan again. Just to add on another great example, um, I want to point out my colleagues at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, on the FET team, P-H-E-T, yeah, have been doing some fabulous simulations for a number of years, mostly geared toward primary and secondary education, focusing on science and math. They've got some great examples of complex interactive simulations, um, and they've been doing a phenomenal job with interactivity and um, accessibility. One of the things I'll mention, one of the one of the challenges and one of the neat things <laughs> of living and breathing, uh, like I'm working in the Silicon Valley now. Like when I was in banking, uh, a project would it would take months and months and months to release. Uh, whereas in in the Silicon Valley, whether it's LinkedIn or anywhere else, uh, you're continuously releasing code. Uh, so on the on 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 the good side. You know, it, it, there's opportunities to always iterate on accessibility. On, on, on the not so good side, sometimes you end up breaking things <laughs> that were once accessible. Uh, and now when you introduce something new, um, you know, it, it makes that experience inaccessible. Uh, but there's that push and pull. You know, we, we're, we are so far away from those sites that are going to stay stable for any length of time anymore. Everyone always wants to come up with a new version or a new release or a new tweak or something there here and there, or there's a new feature that's being added every month or whatnot. And that's always the challenge uh, of today or one of the challenges of today, with particularly with the high traffic sites, because they want you to keep coming back. So they, they reason the way that they do that in part is by introducing new things uh, to give uh, and to entice people to come back for more. If any final okay. questions, um, I'll I'll wrap us up by just saying uh, first of all, uh, after we wrap, um, we will have members of our team available to those in person. If you want to chat about accessibility or learn about some of the services that we offer at Digital Accessibility Services, um, our team will be available around the stage or out in the hall, and we'll be happy to talk to you or or set up another time to chat. Uh, you can always contact us, digitalaccessibility at harvard.edu. Um, and then we want to thank you. Thank you for coming virtually. Thank you for coming in person. Thank you to our, our moderators. Uh, thanks to Alexis, who had to leave, to Michael, to Janelle, uh, to Derek for moderating. Uh, and especially thank you to Jenison for joining us today on uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.